We are now recording. Uh, let me reshare the screen. Okay, and again, feel free if anyone has uh, thoughts, questions, um, experiences they want to share, chime in. Feel free to type into the chat. We'll stop and, and talk about it. So we'll get started with cancer related. Continuing with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Scott, our physical therapist. Thanks, Kevin. And so I think one of the things that we can all kind of agree on with cancer related fatigue is that it's, it's actually pretty hard to define. Um, and so but I also think that there's such an important educational piece that we all as oncology providers need to provide to our, our patients. And so we need to be upfront with them to describe and let them know that this is different from typical fatigue. And so I like to use the NCCN definition of uh, cancer-related fatigue. And I always point out to, to patients is that it's, it's not related to exertion and it's not relieved by rest. And so just simply taking a nap is not going to make cancer-related fatigue go away. And it's probably one of the most common physical symptoms that, that I see, especially as an outpatient physical therapist in oncology. Um, and so it is very prevalent. And I think we also need to normalize that with our patients for them to realize that, yes, cancer-related fatigue is a real phenomenon. All right, so we move on. So again, one of the confounding things with everything here is what actually causes cancer-related fatigue. And I, the way that I try to explain it to patients is that it really is kind of a, the, the perfect storm um, of, of the body having all of these, um, you know, everything's being um, kind of thrown at the body at once between surgery, trying to recover from surgery, and then uh, chemotherapy, and then radiation, if that's part of the treatment plan as well. Um, we definitely see uh, an increase in cancer-related fatigue for our patients who have to undergo stem cell transplants. Um, and I know Angela's gonna talk about this in a little bit later, but I also think that the, the, the mental weight and the mental aspect of having to go through the, the, cancer, um, the cancer process um, can be exhausting as well. And I think that that contributes to that. And Angela's gonna talk about that soon. Uh, so if we move on, I like this graphic actually, this is from the American Physical Therapy Association from one of our courses that we do. Um, and it's, again, it kind of pulls together this idea of the, you know, the kind of the perfect storm, how the pulmonary system can be affected, the cardiac system can be affected, the vascular system can be affected. And so when you kind of put that all together, you're putting this increased load uh, stress on the body. And that is what is contributing to, to cancer-related fatigue. So if we move on. And again, the, the, what we see clinically um, and how this is gonna manifest itself, you know, like obviously yes, a decrease in physical function and, and have patients having a difficult time performing what we call ADLs, activities of daily living, to be able to do yard work or to be able to play with their kids or their grandkids, all the things that they were able to do before that they kind of took for granted. Um, but obviously, yes, it can, it can affect somebody's mood um, and it can feel um, anxious and depressed because they're not able to do the things that they were doing be uh, before. And we can see this translate over into, into the, the work environment as well. Um, and, and so it's, it's something that is multifaceted and it can affect the patient on all different levels of their life. So if we move on. So one of the one of the good things for us, especially in the rehab world, is that in 2019, the American College of Sports Medicine updated their um, exercise guidelines for individuals living with cancer. And when these guidelines came out in 2010, they were pretty general, but in 2019, they were a lot more specific. And they were more symptom specific. And so now those of us, especially in, in rehab, we have a leg to stand on here um, in saying that we now have the research that shows that cardiovascular exercise also combined with strength training helps to decrease cancer-related fatigue. We didn't have this information prior to, prior to 2019, but now we have these new updated guidelines. And so, and this is something for any oncology provider. Um, that can use to use this graphic from the American College of Sports Medicine um, to use and have conveniently uh, available to at least show their patients that being able to exercise helps to decrease cancer-related fatigue. So then if we move on. So one of the biggest questions is how do we assess 
cancer related fatigue. Um, oh, I just saw a question for a link to that slide. I will find that link and I will get it to y'all. Um, and then, so again, the, the thing with, with cancer related fatigue is, is, is it's that it's patient reported and that there's no real true test, you know, objective tests with blood tests to kind of test for that. Um, and so a lot of, um, you know, we have to rely on, on patient report to, to come up with that. Um, and so there are uh, different um, um, outcome measures that, that we use. Uh, ironically enough, the American Physical Therapy Association is developing, is actually in development right now, um, our clinical practice guidelines for cancer-related fatigue to, uh, to assess and screen for cancer-related fatigue. I, I, I was fortunate enough to actually be able to uh, read that um, in draft form. Um, so I can tell you that it is coming out. It should be out later this year. And so we will have, again, um, more defined guidelines to be able to help us as clinicians know how to uh, properly assess um, and screen for cancer-related fatigue. So moving on. So it's not just enough, though, for, for us to tell our patients that you need to go exercise 150 minutes a week because that can be that can be daunting, especially if somebody's tired and if they're either out of their exercise routine or they weren't really in an exercise routine previously. Oh, thank you, Dr. Stanford, for putting that link in. Um, and so that, that's when being able to have a, a rehab professional or um, you know or somebody who's ACSM trained uh, to work uh, with individuals with cancer is really important to be able to to, to personalize and individualize an exercise plan. Um, and one of the things that we do here in Inspiratrip Clinic is we, we take these national guidelines, right? We take these guidelines from ACSM and APTA and we boil it down and we make it applicable to the person sitting in front of us. And so, you know, when we talk about, you know, how do you infuse exercise into your day? Um, you know, is it trying to go for a walk at lunch with coworkers? Is it taking the dog for a walk when you get home from work? Um, and so being able to come up with concrete strategies to be able to help uh, our individuals with cancer, being able to um, be able to find the time and be able to set up a routine to be able to, to exercise moving forward. And moving on. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate that. And um, so I'll talk a little bit about my component of when I talk with people about cancer-related fatigue. Um, and again, this is Jevin, um, the PA with the, the clinic. Um, so the first thing that I think about with cancer-related fatigue is thinking about what is the cause. So thinking about the person's diagnosis, what treatment they've had, how long ago was it that they had their treatment and they completed it? because that can be something to consider as well. And typically we say up to a year after someone's uh, uh, treatment completion with chemotherapy, for example, or say six months from radiation. However, um, that is a very broad sweeping statement and not gonna be specific to any uh, one individual. And it can be dependent on what someone has for comorbidities, um, for medications they might be taking, sleep-related issues, and other things that um, add to the clinical picture of fatigue. So it's really a comprehensive assessment that really that needs to be addressed here with the person. And so we, it's on an individual basis. Um, I ask about the treatment they've had um, when they completed it. Um, I ask how their sleep has been and um, if that could be a contributing factor, for example, with insomnia or um, obstructive sleep apnea, for example, uh, maybe undiagnosed um, or not appropriately managed. Um, and we also uh, talk about like medications, as I mentioned, as well that can be contributing things like uh, antiemetics or opioids um, leading to sedation, um, as well as others. Um, and then in addition to that, we think about uh, fatigue on uh, not only a physical level, but also an emotional level. And so really getting an idea of where a person's fatigue is coming from, whether that's physical component or if there's an emotional component as well with anxiety, depression. Um, and that can be something that um, Angela, our social worker, can talk a little bit more about too. Um, and so, you know, you want to consider all of these factors. And, you know, obviously with regards to uh, the disease itself, if there's any other signs or symptoms of metastatic disease or recurrence to be 
um, concerned about if someone might be presenting fatigue as a result of that. Um, so in, as you've heard from Scott, you'll hear from Courtney, you'll hear from Angela, these different ways that we can address cancer-related fatigue uh, from that multidisciplinary perspective. Um, and there are a lot of treatments um, to think about when considering uh, cancer-related fatigue, exercise, nutritional status, um, non-pharmacological therapies like energy conservation, um, which happy to elaborate on some of that in the discussion. But um, one thing that's come up is psychostimulants or neurostimulants you might hear about a lot, but the data there is kind of murky. Um, it's not consistent. Um, there's been a lot of um, data on um, uh, methylphenidate, some data on uh, minoxidil, um, uh, excuse me, uh, monafidil, excuse me. And um, these are not consistently used or widely used um, without additional screening that's done oftentimes with neurology um, and looking at other potential causes. Um, and you know, the data there being inconsistent, it's not something we routinely go to as a treatment option for cancer-related fatigue um, without other things to be considered like depression or opioid-related sedation, for example. All right, and I will turn it over to Courtney. Courtney, if you can go ahead and help you. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Um, so when we talk about nu the nutrition-related approach to managing cancer-related fatigue, um, one of our main goals is to stabilize blood glucose levels. So this can be done with meal timing, and this entails making sure patients are eating consistently and, if possible, at scheduled times throughout the day. Um, the idea of small, frequent meals, uh, if their appetites aren't good, can be beneficial. Um, an overnight fast allows the body time to rest from metabolizing nutrients. And we aim to establish a macronutrient distribution of 25% of calories from fat, 20% of calories from protein, and 55% from complex carbohydrates, such as whole grains. Um, patients are encouraged to eat at least 25 grams of fiber, primarily coming from fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and to reduce overall intake of added sugars. Um, and as we talk about these goals with our patients and strategize ways for, uh, to help meet them, and we focus on foods that require um, that require little no preparation. I see a comment here. Do you have sample meal plans of what that looks like? So, so kind of to Scott's point, um, we often don't necessarily, we don't have standardized meal plans because each patient is in a unique spot. And so our goal is to meet them where they are. Um, Sometimes, you know, they're not eating well for different reasons. And so our approach is to, um, to strategize kind of best meal times for them. Um, sometimes they eat better in the morning. Sometimes they don't wake up till midday. And so we focus more on getting in those calories at night. So we don't really hand them um, meal plans. What we do often give them and the way that this, this works is to strategize um, foods that require little to no preparation. So we do have lists of what those foods might look like, whether it's um, you know, a small plate of cheese and crackers followed with some avocado, uh, followed by maybe they do well with some yogurt and fruit. Um, so we have meal ideas for them uh, like that. And it, it lends itself more towards small meals and snacks throughout the day. Um, so not necessarily, again, not necessarily uh, standardized meal plans, because um, that doesn't necessarily work well for this population. Uh, we tend to customize it for where they are in their care. You know, are they trying to also uh, manage nausea, taste changes? Um, what are their food preferences? You know, do they prefer Indian culture food versus uh, more American food? And so trying to really, again, customize what their needs are to help come up with a plan that is actually gonna be achievable rather than handing them a list of something that doesn't really apply to them. Um, so often, you know, uh, I think this happens with, with diabetic patients, not necessarily cancer related, but you hand them meal plans. And so often they say, you know, none, I don't eat any of these foods. I'm not going to eat these foods. And so, you know, as much as those meal plans can serve a purpose, um, oftentimes they have limited, uh, limited effectiveness. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Courtney. Appreciate that. Um, Angela, go ahead. Yes. Hi, um, Angela, social work. Um, next slide, please. John. So as everyone has been discussing um, on my team, um, one of the things that I focus on when I'm speaking with patients about cancer-related fatigue is that cancer-related fatigue is not just physical, 
but it's emotional as well. And it's dealing with the physical and the emotional stressors of cancer and um, cancer treatment. And what we know about this is that it really, truly really can have an impact on work, social relationships, mood, activities of daily living, and quality of life after treatment. Um, and so, you know, what we also know that fatigue is not only a symptom of cancer, but it also is a symptom of depression, anxiety, and just overall general stress. Um, you know, hey, Angela, things. your microphone is a little muted. I don't know if there's a way to make, oh. move it closer to your. Yeah, I'll just move closer to my computer. Sorry, is this better? A little bit. I, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but you feel you sound far away to me. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, this, that's better. Okay, this computer is in and I need a new one. <laughs> I'm sorry about being so busy. So, things when I'm meeting with patients. When the fatigue started, you know, um, try to assess is there fatigue physical, is there fatigue, you know, maybe because of an emotional reason, and oftentimes with cancer survivors, I find that it's kind of a combination of both. Um, you know, one of the common things that do come up amongst cancer survivors are sleep disturbances. Um, and we know that that can also be correlated with fatigue. And as Scott pointed out, um, you know, we know it's cancer related fatigue when a patient is reporting eight hours of sleep and they're waking up and still feeling extremely exhausted. Um, another thing that, you know, I like to assess is how long has this sleep issue been happening? Is it something that they've had forever prior to their cancer diagnosis or has it been since, um, you know, their cancer diagnosis and the different treatment that they've gone through? Um, and so, anyways, uh, so you, we will often encourage patients to maybe look at going for a sleep study to try to identify is this, you know, um, uh, some untreated maybe sleep apnea or something like that where they need to have some uh, assistance with or is it more because of anxiety um, or depression that's causing these sleep issues. Um, okay. All right. Thank you, Jevin. Next. Oh, this is my slide. I apologize. Or no, this is my slide. Oh, yes, it's my slide. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so some of the factors that can contribute to cancer-related fatigue um, is a history of mental health, depression, and anxiety. Again, as I talked about earlier, sleep services prior to or during treatment, physical inactivity, but also just these negative self-statements or catastrophizing, you know, what they've gone through. We also know that exposure to childhood stress, including abuse and neglect, can contribute to cancer-related fatigue, as well as loneliness um, in older, older adults. So all of this would be things that I would be assessing for, um, you know, while I'm meeting with patients. Next. All right, so that uh, brings us to the end of our uh, presentation on cancer-related fatigue, and thanks, everyone. Some really good uh, comments coming in here, too. Um, and you know that last slide is just on what's coming next week. But we got a good question from Robin. Um, she brought up a point, um, you know, for for people who don't have um, dietitians available to them, is there any example or anything we can be sharing that can maybe uh, be helpful for cancer-related fatigue as it relates to a survivor? Um, Courtney, I don't know if you had thoughts. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the resources that we use. Um, either myself or my fellow colleagues developed, um, but I can see about making those shareable um, or at least some version of them. I know there's also a really good resource um, that I've seen in previous nutrition classes um, called Cancer Fighting Kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something where I know you can subscribe to it. And if you don't have, uh, and you can give your patients access to be able to log into it. Um, so like maybe if there's not a nutritionist available on site, that's a good resource that they can pull from on their own as well. If you give them like the option to be able to subscribe in. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a uh, the a, yeah, the AICR also has some really wonderful resources and, um, you know, I think they have they have free materials that you can can use or you can actually write to them and have them send you pamphlets and things and they have like cookbooks that people can utilize during treatment and, and I guess into survivorship too. And they were actually going to make a like a virtual cooking class or like a kitchen class. I don't know if that ever got off the ground. It was kind of pre-COVID maybe or right around COVID 
time. So yeah, I did. Yeah, I did this like when I was preparing for our survivorship class, I did like a search for books about this. And I found like I started realizing I was getting like way into like people who are don't have evidence. They're not doing any evidence based thing. They're just like, oh, do this, do that. And then I got like nervous about recommending anything. And so those resources are super helpful. And if there's other like evidence based ones you guys trust, I would love to know those because I got kind of in a weird zone. Yeah, there are a lot of great cookbooks out there and there are a lot of great rec reputable cookbooks and the AICR has great recipes where it gets, um, one of the thing with cancer related fatigue though to acknowledge is that these patients don't have the energy to cook and sometimes providing recipes can make them feel a little more overwhelmed. Um, simplistic recipes are certainly helpful um, and we have some of those available that we offer to our patients where it's limited ingredients, limited chopping of food, but um, you know, I think the resources for these patients, at least in my practice, that I find to be more helpful, again, specific to fatigue, is um, is just kind of food lists of what can I keep in my refrigerator. So it's the yogurt and the cottage cheese, and it's hard-boiled eggs, and it's a scoop of tuna salad that you bought from the grocery store, and egg salad from the grocery store, um, and it's keeping, you know, fruit on hand that doesn't need to be peeled. So things like that. Um, and those lists aren't, I don't think, quite as readily available on some of those listservs, but I'll try and track one down or provide ours because um, those those do tend to be the least overwhelming and most practical um, for this these cancer fatigue patients. Courtney, thanks for that. And yeah, if you want to share those with me, I'm happy to pass along to the group so everyone has it. I'll put it up on the box website too. So we have all have, all have access to those resources. Um, while we're on the nutrition topic, and Michelle, I see your comment. Don't think I'm ignoring it. Um, but uh, there was a great point here from Gwenda. Has anyone tried nutrition apps? Their patients have found it helpful. Um, she saw something at a conference about uh, Nestle Cope's program, and I'm not familiar with that. Um, I don't know, Gwenda, if you have some insight into that, and then maybe Courtney, if you've heard of anything. I haven't heard of the Nestle Cope's program. Um, you know, we do use these apps more from a, um, like, a, a, in an effort to my, you know, the overweight breast cancer patients who want to lose weight. And so in terms of logging their eating, it can be beneficial for that. Um, so, but I don't, I'm not aware of the COPES program. I don't know if I think for, again, cancer related. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to ask too, uh, Gwenda, I don't know if you're able to, to chime in, if you're able to unmute um, and let us know what that is. Yeah, so I had seen it. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know a lot about it. I'd seen it at one of the mass conferences um, a few years ago um, in San Francisco. And I guess it's like a, it's a, it, it's, they call it a cancer oriented personalized eating and emotional support. And I guess, I mean, you have to pay for it. So that's always the downside because trying to get anything for survivorship that costs money is impossible. But I think one of the things that was nice is that the, the staff, like the dietitian, could actually use it as a tracking system as well. Um, and I think it can be tailored if the person's diabetic, et cetera. But it's something that I'd kind of put on my list of a hundred other things to kind of look into at some point. And I just wondered if anybody had had any success with that, or if anybody else was exploring them. Yeah, I haven't used them much with our patient population. Um, you know, I, I do find that they, as a, I don't know, I don't want to generalize, but many of them feel overwhelmed. Um, and the idea of logging can be challenging with everything else going on, but certainly this would be a great resource for the other part of the population who, who was looking for it if, if it pans out to be a good, a good option. Yeah, I kind of think that I agree. And one of the reasons that we hadn't put much effort in is because I think there's the, the people who will do it. And then there's the people who probably need something like that the most aren't going to be the people who are able to, like our head and neck cancer patients, for example. I feel like um, there's people who will use all of the tools and then there's people who will not either have the access or the ability or the motivation. So, but I just thought it was interesting. I figured I'd ask. Thanks. Thank you for sharing. That's great. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for bringing that up. Um, the other uh, question that we had was from Michelle. Um, she asked how many people we are referring to, um, referring to sleep medicine for sleep studies. Um, 
And I, I want to check with the group here to see if anyone has that experience sending a lot of people, survivors, for sleep studies, especially with cancer-related fatigue in mind or alternative causes. And Javin, I just wanted to mention that, you know, we found a barrier in that it was so hard for patients to get an appointment with the sleep medicine physician that, you know, they tended to have to wait months um, and they were really suffering with their sleep apnea. So we actually created a, a, a kind of a fast path. We partnered with a sleep medicine physician. She gave us kind of what her intake would include. And so we do that full intake at our visit. That intake is then forwarded to sleep medicine and she clears the study without having to see the patients. So we really get patients seen much sooner. And we actually refer a lot more patients, I would say about 70% of my patients are referred for sleep, um, for sleep studies, and um, probably 60% or more have significant sleep-related um, sleep apnea, you know. So I, I think, uh, you know, that's, you know, when we're talking about fatigue, sleep is kind of the essential way that we refresh. So uh, I really think it's an underused resource. That's phenomenal to hear, Michelle. And um, yeah, I, you know, I don't know if that's something that you or, or the sleep medicine physician would be willing to have shared with us here, um, the group, or um, you know, maybe we could all tap into that with our sleep medicine professionals we work with, right? And what, what questions can we be asking as providers um, to set them up um, you know, for that appointment and for a sleep study um, and assess for sleep better? Um, I know, Angela, you, this is your bread and butter here. Do you have any other thoughts on assessing for sleep-related issues, or if anyone else does. Yeah, well, I know, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk about sleep hygiene. I mean, that is something that I talk about pretty much in every visit, and then just, you know, and all of us know what that entails, and so that is often something that I will discuss with patients, even if I'm thinking in the back of my mind that this may be the underlying cause is physical, um, but, you know, but I also talk about how stress and anxiety and depression can really impact sleep as well. And another thing that I will discuss is, you know, um, their alcohol intake or if they're using, um, you know, um, illegal substances because that sometimes, you know, depending on when they're using, it can impact their sleep as well. Really alcohol if you're drinking in the evening. So there's all sorts of things that I think about and assess, you know, while I'm trying to figure out is it physical, emotional, or kind of a combination of both. Can I ask, do you um, send, um, how often do you send patients for CBTI for formally? Because I, I find that, again, you know, we have those two worlds where individuals have formal sleep apnea, but then a large percentage have either, um, you know, disturbed sleep um, patterns or a combination of the two. So sometimes I have them addressing sleep and apnea. And, but I, I, you know, I generally first give them the sleep hygiene, but I think most patients, um, because their sleep is really impacted, you know, by their cancer, we know that sleep um, sleep disturbance is actually one of the first symptoms of cancer itself. Sometimes people will have sleep disturbance before they're diagnosed with their cancer. Um, so I often find that individuals cannot get back into a normal sleep routine until they actually formally go to CBTI. And I think again, that's another underutilized resource. What percent do you? I'm, you have resources, I'm assuming, and you send patients over for CBTI? So, um, you know, for us, um, when I'm meeting with patients, um, particularly if they have a heightened level of fear of cancer recurrence, um, you know, and I'll be talking about that more next week, but there's kind of like these different levels that I assess for their, you know, for their fear of cancer recurrence, which we know also can contribute to sleep disturbances. Like, this all goes together, right? All of it is interconnected. Um, but I will talk to patients about seeking mental health counseling and encourage them to meet with a provider who specializes in CBT or CBTI. Um, but really, ultimately, it's up to the patient as to whether or not they want that level of support. And so, you know, um, it's kind of 50%, you know, would be willing to try that. Um, and so, yes, and I do refer to patients out in the community, but we also have a psychologist at Smilo who regularly runs um, CBT groups. Um, and so that is something that we can refer patients to as well. Um, so they're getting that kind of weekly um, CBT um, in a group setting. I'm really curious if other people know of CBTI that's easy to 
access on the internet because I, you know, um, Angela is an expert, but we don't get the, we don't have her 24 seven to run like evening groups. And so, you know, we talk to our patients about it a lot. Um, Michelle put something in the chat here, Sleepio. I, yeah, I'm looking for other resources to refer patients to. I don't know, Michelle, if you want to speak to that at all. And and I'm also curious from the PCPs in the group about, you know, your exposure to sleep issues, I'm sure is really amazing. What have we not mentioned yet in terms of assessment and treatments? So uh, see, um, Sleepio is, um, um, you can have a contract with Sleepio um, or you can, patients can pay individually. Um, it's the most robust um, CPTI program that's out there, but again, it, you have to pay for it. So that is a barrier. Um, but the, probably the most used is the CPTI coach, which was created through the VA and is free. So, um, and so I, yeah, I reckon, I usually start with that and it at least again starts, um, individuals can start to be self-aware of their sleep habits. So it's kind of used in conjunction with the recommendations on sleep hygiene. And now if they're, if they're into apps, you know, now everyone is, now they have an app that they can kind of use to track their sleep. And so I, I do recommend those two, the CBTI coach and the Sleepio. Thanks, Michelle. It looks like um, Carrie Ann also shared a directory for CBTI through UPenn. Um, that's awesome. Um, and, you know, kind of a la the uh, lymphedema therapist directory that I know, Scott, you've, you've shown me before, too. Um, that, that could be a very useful uh, tool. So that's great. Yeah, I think that one thing about, um, I can't speak to how many of my cancer survivor patients get sleep studies. I will say that I have just lots of patients in general get sleep studies. And I think like one of the very few pluses of COVID is because everything is via Zoom and because there's far, there was far less in-person appointments that it's often just a quick telemedicine intake. And then the, most patients can be diagnosed with a home sleep study, which used to be, you know, not be the major thing. Everyone had to come into the lab. So I feel like patients are less reticent to do it now as a consequence of that. I feel like I've had more diagnoses as a consequence. I feel like sleep med providers are more willing to prescribe a basic CPAP recommendation if they have sleep apnea. And then, you know, the technology is so, um, like, it, it's so fantastic that they can download the data and they can get a sense of how well the patient is doing in the process. So I have had, I think, far fewer barriers in the COVID era to sleep studies, both from a technical perspective, but also from a patient perspective. And I have had a few patients who are willing to do cognitive therapy, and also that's done either video, via video or phone now. So um, these patients are definitely accessing it better. And I think I think the biggest impediment is from you know my perspective, as my family will say, I'm the pill pusher in the room, is that everyone wants a pill, right? As everyone thinks that there's an easy fix, which we all in this room know is a temporizing fix and potentially detrimental in the end to their sleep hygiene. So I think the alcohol piece that Angela brought up is huge because, you know, alcohol sales escalated during COVID. So in these last two years, absolutely, people have more sleep-related disorders associated with alcohol, for sure. Um, but I do feel like previously it was a big barrier to get patients in, and it's not right now, at least not in our network currently. Jill, really appreciate that perspective. That's, uh, that's so important to keep in mind. And then also... Um, to dovetail off of that. I know, I believe insurance companies too aren't um, covering in-lab sleep studies as readily either as uh, much as home sleep studies. So um, that's another thing to consider. And yeah, you know, hoping that if there's any silver lining to the COVID era, it's in this case, at least, it's um, having more sleep studies readily available and accessible. So that's, that's great. Um, I do want to transition here to the case presentation. Um, as we, I know we're 20 minutes uh, to the hour here. So I'm gonna share the screen and pull up the presentation for today. 
Did you want to see if anyone else had cases, oh, Kevin? Oh, yes, or? thank you. Yeah, that's a great um, point. Does anyone else have anyone that they would want to share with us today? Um, any cases? Anybody seen patients with fatigue recently and, and want to share a one-liner on that person? No pressure. I'll just say this this topic, which I hadn't even processed that this was the topic for the week. I actually have a friend who's um, getting treated for a uh, light chain myeloma. And she, I, like, I appreciated her comments, Javin, because I was convinced she'd had a pulmonary embolus just from our conversation on the phone, like socially, because she was getting tachycardic when she exercised and her exercise tolerance was down. So I actually snapped a copy of the graphic that, um, the physical therapist got shared that showed the decreased cardiovascular reserve and like shot that over to her because, you know, as it turns out, she's just in the midst of treatment and having fatigue. But um, it was pretty scary thinking that she was mo more dyspneic, really struggling. And she's a 59 year old woman with light chain myeloma who's otherwise really pretty physically fit. And until this diagnosis was incredibly healthy. So um, like this is sort of personally, um, really applicable today for me. Um, so I appreciate your comments, but it, I was like, oh yeah, she could just be tired, right? Like it could just be cancer related fatigue and not pulmonary embolism or new cardiomyopathy or like terrible anemia or something. But um, yeah, so that's my one liner. Thank you. Well, maybe we could play with that a little bit, Jill, and thank you for sharing that. I mean, you know, assuming everything we just talked about the medical clearance of all that, all of that's negative, let's pretend. You know, I'm curious what Scott, Courtney, and Angela might add to, to this woman's case, and maybe it, there's something more in there that Jill can bring back to her friend. Um, yeah, thank you for, for, for sharing that with all of us today, Jill. Um, yeah, I think, I think what you did, you know, to be able to show her a graphic and to be able to kind of, again, it's, it is hard to define, but to be able to show her what's going on on a physiological level, um, and that's why she's feeling so tired, um, you know, you definitely put her mind at ease. Um, and so I think, again, you know, I said this a little bit earlier, I think, I think, I just think that the education piece um, and to also let our, our, our patients know that, that this is very common, you know, I, I think we also see this in survivorship in general. When, when you know survivors come in and they say, I feel like I'm the only one who's tired, or I feel like I'm the only one who's experiencing you know, joint pains from hormone therapy or something like that. And I think for us to be able to normalize that, I think that that's empowering right there for our, our patients to say, no, it's, this is actually pretty common. And so you know, we don't want you to feel like you're out here all by yourself dealing with this thing all by yourself because it's common and we, are researching it and we're investigating it and we're trying to come up with ways to, to treat it better. And, and let's pretend for a moment that, you know, um, she's been very fit and she's having some exercise intolerance. Like Scott, what sorts of strategies could help her either reestablish tolerance or be more gentle on herself, but stay as fit as possible during yeah, the treatment? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I always like to try to reframe goals and I, and I try to come up with to find short-term and long-term goals, you know, and in, in a short-term goal may be, listen, I want you to get on the, on the step machine. I want to see if you can go three minutes without needing, you know, without needing a rest, um, you know, and to be able to, to make it, to make it manageable. I think, again, when we, when we throw 150 minutes a week, of exercise, 150 minutes is a big number, right? And to say, we, I don't expect that tomorrow, right? This is gonna be something that we build up to, all right? So in order to get to that point, we gotta have these steps along the way. And so I think that's where the, the, the personalization of, of what we do um, is so, so critical because we have to make sure that they're that they're not overdoing it because if they do overdo it, then they don't exercise for three, four days, and then they just set themselves back. So to make it manageable, and also again to make sure that it fits to their lifestyle, right? Like exercise needs to fit into the the, the life of somebody, um, not the other way around. And so 
again, whether it's, you know, not everybody's a morning exerciser and some people are morning exercisers. So again, we have to listen to our patients, hear them. I mean, just, just this morning, we heard somebody who says she used to be a morning exerciser, but now she's not. Okay, so we're gonna change that. So I think for us to be really good listeners, to then be able to turn it around and help them, I think is so important. of expectations was probably the biggest and i think that she's she's a you know pretty powerful executive in boston and um in a biomedical biomedical corporation and she just sort of felt like this once weekly chemo infusion is no big deal and i'm just going to power through this and continue my routine and my regular exercise um plan and so just sort of no one had really had a conversation with her about saying hey you really need to like think about pairing back when you're like on week three of chemo or week four of chemo and it's finally kind of sort of catching up with you that you're in the midst of this um and so i think that the sort of resetting of expectations and her feeling not feeling like a failure because she's not able to do the exercise that she has always done and has worked very hard to achieve her level of fitness that always hasn't always been easy for her um, and, you know, I think the other problem, I was like, you have a lot of medical knowledge peripherally and a lot of scientific knowledge based on what you do, but I wish you like, didn't like put all the stock in like your Apple watch and what it says your heart rate's doing and like the oxygen sensor on it. And like, just talk to your doctor about what you're feeling in this moment. And talk to the people who are supposed to be your resources i mean you know she's getting her care at the barber so i mean it's like she has she has very excellent care um but i think that they you know a lot of the medicine was being handled really beautifully but i think the sort of the social aspects of her disease were not necessarily being managed as well as they they, they needed all of you so Actually, I love that you brought that up, and I and I'd love to give Courtney and Angela a minute to reflect on this. But you know, Jill, like, so she has some sense of control over certain parts of her life, right? So she's they're going to do the medical treatment, but she's going to do the exercise and all the other things. And and I think it's important for us as a medical community to partner with patients in a better way, a more effective way. And we we haven't always talked about these sort of soft science things, so patients are left really trying to gain that control back or like exert some control over over their life and so i guess you know courtney just i'm just going to extrapolate because i don't know all the details of this patient but you know what's important for her as she's you know going through this we haven't mentioned hydration at all today so maybe there's something there that um that we should bring on and if your exercise sort of up and down as you're getting adjusted to treatment like how do you counsel patients on nutrition so that they don't end up you know, feeling badly if they've gained weight or if their body composition changes a little bit, you know, while they, they're not as uh, maybe active as they used to be. Yeah, I think these are all really great points. And um, I think, you know, working with someone like that who has always set the bar up here and met the bar up there needs to be reassured that she's allowed to lower that bar um, when it comes to eating also, you know. Um, I think, you know, that, yeah, again, that holds true with food. So I'm not sure how she was eating, but, you know, when it comes to, I mean, I've worked with patients like this who all of a sudden now they're dealing with taste changes. And so the only thing that tastes good to them are the gummy bears that they would never allow themselves to eat before. And they have this like such a heavy, heavy guilt about allowing themselves those five gummy bears each day, you know? And so some of it is just reassuring them that that's okay, you know? Um, and, and really, um, it, women in particular are so hard on themselves and um, don't necessarily give them credit for all that they're doing. And how many patients I talk to that say, I'm doing it all wrong. And I say, okay, well, tell me what you are doing. And just pointing out the good, you know, pointing out, look, look at what you're doing. You know, these are what the goals are. And here are all the ways that you're meeting them. And yes, you may not be reaching you know, the 150% that you had been doing before, but you're still at or close to that 100%. And so just giving them the room to, to uh, reevaluate expectations at that point is, is important, I think. Um, and I've seen that just the, the patients exhale when you validate that for them, that they're allowed to do that. They're allowed to incorporate 
those foods that they maybe didn't allow themselves to before. Angela, any comments on, um, from a psychosocial aspect? And again, we didn't get into, we're just pretending here at this point because of the, but I really appreciate Jill bringing this case forward as a framework. Right, and I think it's so important. I, I mean, so, I speak to so many patients that are quite similar to what Jill shared. Um, you know, they're, they're these high powered people that have been involved with so many things and they get diagnosed with cancer and it's this loss of control. Right, and so it's all about how do I gain back control of something that feels so out of my control? And, you know, I think it's so important to, to you know, not only validate, but to provide, you know, to listen to them and to also emphasize the importance of, of being patient with yourself and kind to yourself, but most importantly, self-care. Like this is the time in your life to truly take care of yourself. And oftentimes I find that patients have spent their whole lives kind of taking care of everybody else. And so now this is the time to take care of themselves. Um, it's, in my opinion, I'm, I'm going to be biased here, but I think every single person benefits from talking to a mental health professional, even if they think it's fine. Um, you know, it just provides that outlet to be able to talk about how you're truly thinking and feeling about something. And it can be quite beneficial. Um, you know, again, we know that cancer impacts all aspects of your life, socially, emotionally, spiritually, financially, even sexually. It impacts everything. And so having that outlet um, to be able to talk to a mental health professional or going to a local cancer support group can also be very helpful. Again, also things like integrated medicine, um, going for massages and Reiki. And you know, um, I know our cancer center has that here. And I and Dana Farr, but we definitely have um, integrative medicine resources. And so getting involved is again is part of that self-care and being kind to yourself. Um, I think is so important. If I can, um, if I can add maybe two more uh, quick points before we uh, get ready to wrap up here, I can't believe how fast this hour has gone by today. Um, uh, my my recent uh, physical therapy student, and now doctorate of physical therapist um, Stephanie Stoller, just pointed out that um, we we have and we can, Jen, I'll send this to you. We can put it in the box account um, to be again to be able to talk to patients about their um, their metabolic uh, um, equivalents and how simple activities of daily living all require certain levels of energy and when you break that down for them to say taking a hot shower exerts the same amount of energy as going for a walk at a 15 minute mile pace and when you when you frame it that way it, it blows their mind and so to be able to this idea of energy conservation to be able to say okay do one load of laundry and then take a little break right unload the dishwasher, take a little break, rather than trying to do all those things in the morning and then you're toast for the rest of the afternoon. So again, to be able to educate our patients on how everything that we do, even sleeping, requires energy, I think that that's empowering for them. Um, and maybe just the kind of a last point, and maybe this is more of a personal note, but um, I know that uh, patients so often don't like the, the new normal, idea and so and, and maybe jill this this goes a little bit back to your you know your your friend you know about how people say i want to go back to what i was doing before i want to go back to what i was doing before and they may not be able to go back to their previous routines so instead of calling it a new normal we're gonna we're just gonna say well let's let's reframe that let's maybe come up with a different method of exercise right so you used to run before but you don't have that same kind of exercise capacity now, okay, so pick up hiking or pick up cycling or pick up something else or be able to pick up a yoga class or something else like that. So we're still encouraging exercise and we're still encouraging movement. Um, but I think, again, like if we're trying to set our survivors up for success, we have to be able to do that pivot sometimes and to be able to to allow them to, to to try new opportunities i think we could have a whole session on like uh ways to frame or discuss survivorship and like new normal and how some people react to that or cancer journey or <laughs> um that might be another program in and of itself on pitfalls and, and language around all of this but so thank you for saying it like that scott i like how you how you couched that yeah, thank you 
Yeah, I mean, and um, I think a good takeaway from this too, from everyone that's shared has been, you know, there are some key points and, and you know, quick tips that can be provided. Um, as, as Scott was saying with, um, you know, the energy exerted for a 15 minute walk with a warm, you know, com compared to a warm shower, you know, things like that and how we're talking with our cancer survivors can make a big difference. Um, and I can tell you just from working as part of a multidisciplinary team, I've learned so much um, where my education would fall short as a PA uh, from these other disciplines. So it's about learning from each other. And um, so it's, it's all, all one giant learning experience that we're, we're here and sharing in today too. So um, thanks for everyone that's shared. Um, we're five minutes to the hour. Um, we definitely got a, a great case study and thank you, Jill, for um, sharing uh, your friend here. And, and uh, uh, it sounds like she'd be the type that would be supportive of it too. So, <laughs> so um, I, you know, does anyone have any final thoughts in, in the last five minutes before we wrap up here and give you back maybe a few minutes to your day? This is really great participation and um, just the dialogue and what's happening in the chat and, and all of you being engaged so so means so much to me. I feel like I've found new energy with this ECHO program. So Jevin, what do we have coming up next week? Yeah, let me go ahead and pull up the screen for next week here. Um, we're going to be talking about fear of recurrence. Um, and as I say, same bad time, same bad channel. Uh, next Wednesday, May 25th, 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, we'll have, uh, again, a brief um, didactic with a case presentation. Again, as, as Jill showed you here today, it can be that simple. Um, bring a, a case if you have someone that you'd like to talk about. Um, we'd be happy to talk about it. Um, we have something ready, if not. Um, and I'll make sure the slides come out in advance. Um, and just a quick reminder, there's a post-session survey um, that can be shared as well. And for everything that's been brought up today, uh, all the resources, I'm gonna take what's here in the chat um, and post uh, the resources that we have up on Box as well. So everyone has access to those um, in addition uh, to what you, know, you just got out of the Zoom today. And then the uh, recording will go up on the YouTube playlist too. All right. Thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. <laughs>